Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Minister Nicole Smith, and I bring you greetings from the New Life Bible Church located at 1420 Hope Loop Road, Fayetteville, North Carolina, where our pastors are Alan S. McLaughlin, and our first lady is Norma McLaughlin. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and I pray that something is said that will be encouragement to you. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you to join us in communion this morning, so I'm just going to give you a few minutes to go ahead and get you some juice, something that would represent the blood of Jesus. And I want you to go ahead and get you some crackers or bread, something that will represent his body. And so before we go into that, we just kind of want to be mindful. Paul reminds us of self-examination. And he says, let a man first examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. And maybe there's something there that you've been struggling with, that you've been dealing with. I want to take just a few minutes to examine ourselves, to um, allow us to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. In the same night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup and he said, take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. And he said, as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Eternal Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you. We thank you so much for your son. We thank you for the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We thank you for eternal life. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the opportunity to spend time with you this morning in your word. We thank you so much that you would give us an opportunity to be mindful of what you, your son has done for us on the cross. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and go right into our message. Our message this morning is our text is going to be coming from the book of Genesis and it's going to be chapters 3 verses 8 through 13. We're going to do a little synopsis in verses 1 through 7. So if you would go ahead and get uh, turning your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3 verses 3 through 18, but I'm going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 7, um, but we're going to focus on verses 8 through 13. Now the serpent was more cunning than any animal in the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God really said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, you certainly, you certainly will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat it from it, that your eyes will be open and you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. When, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise she took some of the fruit and she ate and she also gave some to her husband and he ate and then her eyes of that both of them are open and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings now we're going to go ahead and pick up in verse eight and that's where we're going to be coming from i just kind of wanted to give you an idea and a synopsis beginning in verse eight it says now they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and he said, Adam, where are you? And he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I've commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. 
Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, your mercy, and your, your grace. We thank you for loving us as you do. And we ask, Father, that you will open our hearts and minds to receive what it is that you will have us to receive. In Jesus' name, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Wow. Genesis 2 tells a story of a perfect place in the Garden of Eden, a place of contentment, a place of joy. And we read in verses 1 through 7, conversation between Satan and Eve. Wow. It's amazing that the first conversation, the first conversation is between the devil and a human. And the conversation is about God. Conversation is about the word of God. Keep that in mind, the word of God. One of the things Satan had to do that in order to get rid of God's rule, he had to get rid of the authority of the word. So that's the first thing they said. I think that, and I'm going to get my Bible right here. I think that we have minimized this in so many ways. People have told me, oh, it don't take all of that, or, or you're doing too much, and oh, 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 yes, it does. It takes all of this and some. Now we pick up where Adam and Eve are in the garden, and they hear God walking in the cool of the evening. And they hear him, and he says to them, Adam, you know, where are you? So I want to present to you a title this morning called, Who Told You That? Actually listening to the voice of God. But who told you that? The three points I want to share with you this morning real quickly that will help us listen to the voice of God. And we're going to just start in verse 8. Verse 8 says, in chapter 3, now they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees. And the Lord called to them. He called to the man and he said, where are you? And he said, well, I heard you. I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you? Who told you you were naked? Did, did you go and eat of the tree that I told you not to eat of? The very first point that I would want to share with you is seek refuge in God. That's the only hiding place. To be in the garden and just be around God and just to spend time with him every single day. I can only imagine the joy and the contentment and the comforting presence of God that they had. And, and you know, when they called, you know, when he came and or when he called them they were always there they probably were just awaiting his presence there and i just can imagine the way that must have felt you know because before they didn't have a reason because they were always in his presence he's always been there he was always there is there something about hearing god that frightens you and what it is what is it that you are hiding from when i was a teenager um before my dad became a pastor, he was a deacon. And I remember going to church and I, um, if you had to sit by your mom, that means you were in trouble. This particular Sunday, my mom let me sit by my best friend. My best friend was Kathy Davis, I remember. Um, and so um, this particular um, week, um, we had been talking on the phone and we had decided we were going to put certain things in our pocketbooks so that, you know, we can kind of look at them and play with them during service. And, you know, the message was not something that we were very interested in. So this particular day, um, this Sunday, we're in the back and we get a little loud and I, I see my mom turn around. And she gives me this look. And of course, we all know what that look meant. Um, even if it wasn't your mama, you knew what that look meant. And so she looked at me one too many times with that look. Well, we know what that meant. That mean I'm going to get you when I get home. <laughs> wow. And I tell you, when um, one of the things is we would get in the car. She wouldn't say anything in church. She wouldn't say anything when we got in the car. She wouldn't say anything when we got home. All you knew is when you got home, you just just stay out of her sight. So I'd go in my room, you know, just hope she would forget. And of course, you know, she didn't forget. She just took a long time remembering. 
And so one of the things that I remember is we could tell who was walking down the hall as opposed to my mom or my dad. So my dad, he would be walking down the hall and he had slippers on. So you could hear a medium walk, but you could hear the slipper slide, step, slide, step, slide. But it was a hard slide and a step, hard slide. So, you know, we knew that was our dad. Now, my mom, she, you could hear her slippers coming, but hers was a little bit quicker, was softer and medium, but it was like a, a constant step. T -t 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 you know, it was a constant step. So we knew that. So I'm in my room and I hear my mom going down the hall. And I'm like, oh, and hopefully she's going to cook dinner. And so she goes and it's not maybe five, ten minutes. She's like, Nikki, Nikki, come here. I'm like, oh, Lord. So, you know, I'm moseying along. I don't want to go out there immediately. So I go out there, I'm moseying along. And before I can actually open my door to walk out, I hear my dad walking down the hall, you know, you know, the slept you know, it's the heart. And I'm like, oh my goodness. So I get in the dining room and of course, there's my mom and my dad standing right there. And My mom is not there to spank me. My mom is there to instigate the spanking. My dad is there to give me the consequence of what happened earlier that day. He was there to spank me. Adam and Eve was very familiar with the sound of God. They heard it every day. It was an everyday event. You know, I think about what I did. What would make you hide? You know, we just can't take the blame. We're hiding behind this mask and, and we're using the, this mask, our fig leaves, our olive leaves, and we're trying to hide what we've done because we're afraid to face it. And fear causes us to point the finger, to blame. Fear causes us to hide. You know, I'm in my room, <laughs> hiding, so I think. You know, I like to stay in my room for as long as I possibly can, hoping that she will forget what I did. But, you know, I was trying to think of an excuse to get out of this spanking. So I'm thinking, I'm going to blame Kathy. You know, she's not here. And I'm thinking of all of these excuses to get out of going through some pain. We shift the blame, we shift the responsibility to anybody so that we can take the focus off of ourselves, so that we don't have to take the consequences. But I say, take the consequences, take the penalty, take what's coming to you. It, it's so much better just to come clean than to lie and to prolong the inevitable. When my kids were growing up, we had this thing that we call off the record. That meant that you can admit what you've done and you would not get punished. And they used it a lot when they realized that they weren't going to get in trouble. It was like a refuge for them. And they always prefaced it with, okay, mom, this is off the record. I'm like, okay. So I remember my daughter taking me in the bathroom and she said, mom, this is off the record. It was a long pause. She wasn't telling me something she did. She was telling me something I did. She said, you make me feel like I don't do anything right. I could clean the whole kitchen and you'll find one thing wrong. I could clean my whole bedroom and you'll find one thing wrong. My immediate response in my head was, hold up, I'm your mama, okay? I tell you what to do. That would have been my excuse, but I didn't say that. Because as soon as she said it, after the thought left my head, I started crying. She wasn't only just right, but that was something that had happened to me when I was little. So I passed it on to her. I couldn't say anything. All I said was, I'm sorry. And from now on, that will not happen again. So I kind of figured if she's feeling that way, maybe the other three are feeling that way. So from that moment on, I said, you know what? I am not even going to be around when they're doing their chores. And when I see it, I'm going to compliment them because at the time, I think I was around 33, 32. And I said, I can't put 32 years on an 11-year-old. I can't put my 32 years on a 12-year-old. 
one of the reasons we feel like we the need to cover ourselves or to hide is because we don't want anybody to see it. And what's funny is what we're hiding is our stuff. It belongs to us. I mean, it's not like we stole something and we're trying to hide the merchandise. It's our stuff. Psalm 46 and 1 says, God is our refuge. He's our strength. He's our helper who is always found in the time of trouble. The very thing that you're hiding from is the very thing God wants. Psalm 119 and 114 says, you are my hiding place and my shield. I wait for your word. Psalm 32 and 7 says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. For you have died. And I like this scripture. This is in Colossians 3 and 3 through 4. And it says, you've died. My life is hidden in Christ. When Christ shall appear, then I shall appear. But until then, you should only see Christ. I'm hidden in him. He wants what we have. You know what? I take a lesson and I say to you, let's take a lesson from Adam and Eve. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. It's a wonderful thing when you can do a do-over. God is a God of first, second, third, and fourth chances on up. God created us to have fellowship with him. Yes, Satan is designed to plan to destroy that creation, and we call that the fall of man. However, God knew man still had potential to live out the design of his creation. God repaired that fellowship through animal sacrifices, and then finally, praise God, through Jesus. But man's potential for fellowship never wavered. Can I tell you something? God knows your potential. How people treated you or what they've said about you does not change your potential. Disappointments, setbacks does not change your potential. Which brings me to my second point. Listen and respond to your name. That's particular scripture. And that particular scripture um, that we want to read verses 9 through 11. Respond to your name. Respond to your name. And you know, let me find that scripture very quickly. Respond to your name. And so let's look at verses um, 9. It says, Then the Lord God called the man and he said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I told you not to eat from? Wow. Who told you that? First, Adam hears the sound of God. And then it's followed by a conversation. He had such a deep relationship with God. He heard God before God even spoke. God asked a question that he already knew. He only asked it because he wanted you to know. Basically, God is saying, if you can hear yourself say it out loud, I just want you to know how much sense it don't make. I think a lot of times if we say stuff out loud, that we say to other people, or we say, and we hear ourselves say it, we're like, oh, <laughs> did I say that? I shouldn't have said that. There's a scripture in John 10, 3 through 4, and it says, A sheep hears my voice, but a stranger they will not follow. A sheep will follow him only because he knows their voice. And yet they won't follow a stranger. What they will do, if they hear the voice of a stranger, they'll run from him because it's not a familiar voice to them. My sheep hear my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. If God didn't say it, who said it? We have to investigate, and we begin to, we, we have to, before we respond out of what's said or what the lie is, do some detective work, ask some questions, get some answers, and all the answers you need is right there in his word. 
Figure it out. You won't have to call nobody. You won't have to pick up the phone. His word will give you the answer. And you know, Satan still whispers. He still whispers in our ears. You're broken. All you do go unnoticed and you are unappreciated. And guess what? They laughing at you. He whispers those thoughts in our head. And you know what God says? Who told you that? God says, I say to those who delight in my word, you will all you will prosper in all you do. You know, we know people who say things. We hear our kids say things and it doesn't make any sense. And we ask them, who told you that? Where did you get that from? Who told you that? Satan whispers and he says, you're getting ready to lose everything you got. And God says, who told you that? I said, those who trust in me will lack no good thing. Satan comes back like he did in the garden. He whispered, you ain't nothing but a failure. You're not going to be good at anything. And God says, who told you that? I say to those who follow my instructions, you will never stumble. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. The enemy doesn't want you to know your potential. The lie Satan told you is actually what he wants. The lie that Satan told Adam and Eve is something that he wants, but he knew he couldn't get it. That's why he got kicked out of heaven. He knew nobody could get it. So he knew when he formed it in his head and it slipped out of his mouth, he knew it was a lie. He knew it from the beginning. Yet they responded to a lie. You will respond to what you believe. If it's a lie, you will respond to the lie. My question to you is, who told you that? And who are you listening to? You know, the woman at the well, she was surprised. For Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. So Jesus said, so she said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Why are you asking me for something to drink? John 4 and 10 says, if you only knew, if you knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you'd be asking me and I would give you some living water. If you only knew who was saying what, you would ask God first. So my question to you, what are you dealing with? God is saying, if you only knew your potential, if you only realize that I can make it possible, and if you only saw it, I'd give it to you. Here's a woman who was told by five men that she was broken, because that's basically what they were saying. And God said, who told you that? The women in town, they rejected her. She had to come and get water in the heat of the day. They basically said she was broken. And God says to her, who told you that? God showed her that she had potential. Brings me to my third and final point. Verse 12 through 13, the man said, the woman who you gave me to be with, she gave me the fruit of the tree to eat. And then I, then the Lord said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And she said, the serpent, he deceived me. He tricked me. My third point is, know your enemy. Anytime you are asked something, and anytime your answer is about somebody else, somebody else's name is in your mouth, you shifted the blame. I wanted to blame Kathy so bad because I was trying to get out of a spanking. I did not want to reap the repercussions. I used to tell my kids, every time you have to make an excuse for what you did and somebody else's name is in your mouth, you just made it okay for you to do it again. I'm going to say that again. Anytime you have to make an excuse for what you did, you just made it okay. For you to do it again because you never accepted responsibility of doing it the first time 
and you wonder why things won't change. You wonder why year after year after year after year, things won't change. It's because responsibility has not been accepted. Has not been accepted. And I need to plug my phone in because it's about to die on me. Give me one second, people. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. I don't want it to die on me. And don't allow. Give me one second. Let's just make sure that it's working. It's working on me. Ah. Technical difficulties. Just give me a second. Technical difficulties. Here we go. Awesome, awesome. Okay, okay, Houston, we don't have a problem anymore. So anytime we we shift the blame, what we're saying is, I don't want to accept the responsibility. Adam and Eve, Adam did not accept the responsibility. Eve did not accept the responsibility. They shifted the focus from themselves onto somebody else. Somewhere in your answer to God, Somewhere in your answer to any questions that's asked you, somewhere in your response, your name has to be in it. He called your name. And we have to say, Lord, I'm sorry. I did it. I was disobedient. I ate of the tree. I'm ashamed. I am. Somehow or another, we, we, we can't seem to bring ourselves to look at ourselves and say, you know, I did that. You remember Family Matters, Urkel? He used to do something and then he looked at it and say, did I do that? Yes, you did. And when you admit it, God finds favor with you. In closing, I want to show you something that I think that is going to change your perspective about yourself, your perspective about your enemy, I want to show you something that I believe is going to free you up. If you come to the 1030 service, I'm going to actually have a volunteer, but I'm going to talk this one out. You see, we look at a person that is our enemy, and we're looking at that person. But the thing is, it's not the person. It's the spirit behind the person. The person may have said something, done something, all of these things that you, you, you didn't like. But it's not the person, it's the enemy behind it. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, spirits, and wicked places. That's where our battle is. But we waste so much time battling and fighting a person. We're fighting the wrong fight. Spiritual powers work directly. The, the spiritual powers that work, they're tied directly to sin and darkness in the spiritual realm. So it's easy to look at somebody and want to snatch them up and, you know, and, and, and deal with them. But that's the wrong fight. The real fight is against Satan and his angels. The real fight is, thank God that he doesn't leave us to fight by ourselves and fight on our own. But what he's done is he's given us some weapons and he's given us weapons that were created specifically for fighting spiritual battles. When we fight spiritual battles, we're fighting against a spiritual enemy, not a natural person. Ephesians 6 and 12 says it, for our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual forces in the heavenly realm. So easy to look at the people that are coming against us and just want to lash out and, and clap back. and But it's the demonic spiritual forces that are at play in and around them. That's what we battle. That's where the fight is. Second Corinthians 10 and 5 says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh because the weapons of this warfare, they're not carnal, but they are mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. And we are pulling down any lofty thing that brings itself up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive 
and we're making it obedient to Christ. He's not talking about a human being. He's talking about the spirit behind the person. I think that if we know who our enemy is and we begin to fight the real enemy, we're going to be so busy understanding spiritual warfare that we're not going to have any time to focus on this physical person. Now, it doesn't take away the pain, doesn't take away anything that's done. But if we spend our time pointing fingers at people, we're going to miss out on the whole purpose of the fight that's, and Satan wins. If you're messed with in the natural, we are required to handle it in the spiritual. Sometimes, sometimes you got to distance yourself from people. If they care, they'll notice. If they don't, well, then you know where you stand. I got an AirPod challenge. I got a challenge for you. And this is a little bit different from what I normally do. And I've got to find my AirPods. This is a little bit different. If you come to the 1030 service, everybody is going to get a pair of AirPods. But what I want you to do, and this is a different challenge, and normally I'll give you something and I'll tell you to go ahead and put it somewhere in a place that you can look at it every day and be reminded of this message. But this is what I want you to do. This one's a little bit different. I want you to put your ear pods on. And I want you to take about 10 minutes a day, just 10 minutes. I want you to pick a time every day and just take about 10 minutes and many of you probably already have your devotionals this is different this is in addition to and i want you to take about 10 minutes and instead of reading the word i want you to put on your ear pods and i want you to press play and i want you to listen to the word for 10 minutes do it every day listen to the word if you have the app on your phone there is a button where you can just press play and i think the more that we listen to the word of god the more that we begin to hear his voice and know his voice. And we realize in the power of God, in the power of the word of God, the power of his promises, when another voice comes, we'll be able to hear it and understand if it's a lie or not. He's our hiding place. He's our refuge. And as long as you are in his word and you're listening to his word you're gonna know who he you're gonna know who your enemy is and we're always gonna know what the question to that what the answer to that question is who told you that who told you that so i want you and for those of you who are not coming to go ahead and get you some ear pods get you whatever it is you use to listen to i want you to take me up on that challenge and now March, April, May, May the 1st, I will be speaking again. Give yourself 30 days to put your ear pods in, 10 minutes a day, and only listen to the word. Don't listen to a devotion. Don't listen to a song. What you do in your devotion, that's different. Listen to it. If you want to take a certain scripture and listen to it in consecutive, and you listen to the next verse and listen, however you choose to do it, let the word of God come in you every single day. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you to do that. I want to thank you for listening. I pray that something has been said that has been encouraging to you. I pray that when we get into the word and we understand who said that, we won't be questioning. We won't be, it won't be chaos. It won't be, not to say that anything is not going to bother us, but we'll know where to go. And we'll know that our warfare, our weapons are not carnal. And we'll know that our enemy is not a human being. It's the enemy himself. Is Satan. And we can't fight him with words. We've got to fight him with the word of God. Have an amazing day. Bye-bye.